Hello everyone and welcome back to my show, The Interview. I'm your host, Susan Lee McDonald. Haigu, otherwise known as the Korean wave, is starting to sweep the entire globe. People are so fascinated by the Korean culture, Korean dramas, and Korean K-pop that really stands above a lot of the rest. Because K-pop has become so popular, there are many people from around the world who are trying to scour new talent here in Korea. And none other than an amazing producer named Gordon Williams is here in Korea to see if there is a new international star here in Korea to discover. He has discovered the likes of Alicia Keys, Lauren Hill, and so many other incredible people and has worked with some of the best in the industry, also known as Quincy Jones number no. two. Let's get to meet Gordon Williams. Gordon Williams, also known as Commissioner Gordon, has produced the albums of many top singers in America and worked with countless world-renowned musicians. He began his career in music as a DJ before signing on to Columbia and Sony where he produced the soundtracks of the blockbuster movie Men in Black. He gained huge success at a young age with the album The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, which he worked on as a recording engineer winning the Grammy Awards for the Best R&B Album and Album of the Year in 1998. Stay tuned to find out more about Commissioner Gordon's life story, career in the music industry, and experience in Korea. Hey Gordon, thank you so much for being on the interview. I'm so excited to have you here. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. Well, I know that the music industry knows you, um, you know, back and forth, and a lot of the artists that you've worked with have become the world top stars. Would you mind telling us a little bit about what you've done and, and what you do currently? Oh, sure. Sure, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> um, professionally, I'm known as Commissioner Gordon. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an engineer and producer. I started as a DJ. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ricky Ricker, yeah. Back when it was still Ricky yeah, Ricker yeah. um, in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And um, from DJing, went into remixing, from remixing, went into uh, engineer, uh, engineering, really, mm -hmm. and mixing, mixing records. Now, not DJ mixing, but actually mixing and recording mm -hmm. studios mm -hmm. and producing. And uh, some of the artists that you, you, know, you might know of, uh, Lauryn Hill, um, Will Smith, Alicia Keys, Amy Winehouse, and the, uh, the Marley family, Stephen, Stephen Marley in particular, but I've worked mm -hmm. with Damien as well. You know, I'm such a huge fan of Lauryn Hill. And uh, Me too. she's yeah. just got the most beautiful, incredible voice. And uh, I think really from a young age, she just had incredible talent, yes? Yeah, Lauren is a very special person. Lauren mm -hmm. is someone that, you know, I, I always tell people she's an old soul. You know, mm -hmm. Lauren has, has the ability to, um, to draw you in. I mm -hmm. mean, e even in the recording studio, mm -hmm. you know, and um, she's a, a great interpreter of song. You know, so and she's. I think she's always had that. I think mm -hmm. she's always had that, which is what captivates people mm -hmm. about her. And she can rap, so you know you don't really find. You know, it's very rare to find a person that could it was as proficient rapping as mm -hmm. they were singing. So mm -hmm. she she was like the total package. And she's so beautiful to boot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just yeah. just so gorgeous. Yeah, she has it all. Yeah, mm -hmm. when you were working with Lauren for her first album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Mm -hmm. um, were there any special things that happened during the recording sessions that are kind of noteworthy? Yeah, I mean, so many special things, you know. I mean, she was having children at the same time, so she had her first child, Zion, mm -hmm. and that was really special to see, even with the song that she wrote about him, to see mm -hmm. the song happen, Zion actually happen, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, grow up right in front of us, because he was in the studio a lot when we were recording, mm -hmm. you know, recording the, uh, recording the album. Um, you know, just very significant. I, I, I have one, I'll give you, a, I'll give you, yeah, you know, for you, Susan, I'll give you one of these. <laughs> this happened one time. This actually mm -hmm. wasn't while we were making the album. This mm -hmm. happened during the tour, which was mm -hmm. the first tour that, it, actually this tour started right as the album was done. Mm -hmm. And we were in Denver and um, after the show, because I also mixed the shows live as well. So I was there again, 
first to get there because you got to set up and mm -hmm. last to leave. And we had a huge production. I mean, mm -hmm. there was 19 people on stage. Wow. The crew was about 75 people. And I was pretty much in charge of dealing with sound and production and setup and all that stuff. So it would be, you know, after the show was over, mm -hmm. it could be a, a good hour that I would still be in the venue after everyone was gone. Mm -hmm. So I was by the soundboard. The place had cleared out. And um, this little girl, come, well, I say a little girl, but she was about 16, maybe mm -hmm. 16, 17, came up to me and asked me, um, you know, was Lauren still there? And I said, uh, I said, well, no, I don't think so. I think she's probably gone. I said, um, what can I do for you? And then she opens up, she has a poster rolled mm -hmm. up, and she opens up the poster, and on the poster is a picture of a baby, and it says, thank you, Lauren, and, you know, some words about, you know, that basically this was like Lauren's um, godchild. So she begins to tell me the story that she got pregnant, you know, in a, in a situation that wasn't really a great situation, mm -hmm. a young girl and, and got into it, but, mm. um, and was afraid to speak to her mother about it and mm -hmm. was gonna have an abortion. Mm -hmm. And the song Zion mm -hmm. actually, you know, she, listening to the song mm -hmm. it made her feel like, okay, she needs to talk to her mom about it and see, you know, mm -hmm. is this the right thing? Mm -hmm. And her mother actually, you know, spoke to her and then she decided to keep the baby and she was really, really happy. Aww. And she was showing me the picture to give, the poster to give to Lauren to say, Aww. hey, you know, if it wasn't for her and this song, that this child wouldn't have been here. So things, that was really, I mean, it was a beautiful so little baby deep. too. Yeah, it was really deep, yeah. <sighs> You've named some really incredible artists, and uh, I think among them you've also worked with Diana Ross, Beyonce, Jay-Z. Um, can I ask you what it was like to work with Beyonce and how that happened? Um, Beyonce actually worked with her when she was uh, just starting. Mm. Um, I worked with her when, at the time that I met Beyonce, I was at Sony uh, Music, mm -hmm. working at Columbia Records. I was a staff producer at A&R there, and Beyonce was part of the group Destiny's Child. Mm -hmm. And they were doing a Christmas record, and I got called in to work with the group. It was amongst other groups. It was a compilation record, mm -hmm. so it featured, actually it had Alicia Keys on it. It was her first uh, signing there as well. So really? she, Yeah, so Alicia probably was about maybe 16 mm. at the time, and Beyonce was probably like close to that age, somewhere mm -hmm. around there, because they were all really young. You know, what really struck me about her is how professional she was already at such a young age, mm -hmm. and how she was able to pull everyone together. I mean, they only mm -hmm. did a, a part in the record, but mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was clear that that girl was a star. Wow. When you were working with Alicia Keys, you said that one of the first times you worked with her was uh, with Beyonce and Destiny's Child for the Christmas album, mm -hmm. but when you first started working with her on her album, tell us about how you were linked up with Alicia at that time. Same as with Beyonce, I was at Sony, mm -hmm. and Alicia's first deal, she was signed to Columbia Records, mm -hmm. and I was an A&R person there, this A&R and a staff producer, and mm -hmm. she was working on her record, and we ended up going in, her and a boyfriend at the time, who was her producer, um, well, they kind of produced together, mm -hmm. you know, the three of us went in the studio, and we worked, and, and the first record that I did with her on her own was on the Men in Black soundtrack, which a lot of people don't know, mm -hmm. she has an actual song on the Men in on the Men in Black soundtrack. That's so cool. That's yeah. one of my favorite movies too, and um, it's one of the movies that I actually bought a soundtrack for because I almost never <laughs> seem to Same buy soundtracks. soundtracks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most people don't. What do you think it was about that soundtrack in particular that just really got people's attention? Uh, that song, you know, the movie was really strong, and Will was such a, um, you know, such a character, and then was, and then he's a pretty good rapper, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people forget that he was doing that first, you know, before. Right. The, the television, so he was able to, I think, really put together a song that embodied the, the, the movie, mm -hmm. but also worked as a commercial song. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference, that it could play on the radio, but also play in a movie, mm -hmm. play in, you know, background in the store, you know, it was, it was just a really catchy, mm -hmm. catchy song. So, Gordon, this is your first visit to Korea, and I'm curious what your experience has been like during your first visit. Um, very eye-opening. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I, prior to this trip, I was in China, so I spent a week in China and now a week here. So both the contrast and the similarities, you know, were, were great. The people were great. The hospitality and the way that I was embraced, uh, you know, it was, just, it was just a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Korea in particular, as far as, you know, um, the recording industry and, and the, 
the level of artistry that's mm -hmm. here, you know, is very impressive. You know, it's mm -hmm. very impressive, very developed. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of great artists, a lot of great songs. Even though you don't, you know, for me, not understanding the language, but I'm learning. I'm working on my Korean mm -hmm. right now. Yay! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, and my Chinese. Um, you can feel you can feel the music. You know, mm -hmm. you can feel the music and you can feel the songs. And and I've met some you know, super, super talented people. You know, mm -hmm. I've heard some really strong rappers. I heard some mm -hmm. great singers. I heard some great producers. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, I, I just, I just want to give the whole country a hug. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to hug you right back. <laughs> because it's not typical for a lot of really super accomplished uh, producers and um, people from the scene in the States to come to Korea. But recently, uh, as you probably know, Quincy Jones came here. And yeah. he was someone that you worked with a long time ago, yes? Yeah, Quincy was probably, I would have to say, my first real music mentor. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't spend a lot of time in the studio. We spent more time talking than anything else. Mm -hmm. But he's such, you know, he's the, He's the, he's the master, you know, he's such a master that one conversation, you could learn so much, you could change your life in one conversation, you know, because yeah. of the, the, the breadth and the width of experiences that he's had, so. He came to Korea basically looking for undiscovered talent or a, pot a potential international star. Yes. And I'm curious, is that something that you're interested in too? Yeah, I mean, I could understand knowing him. See, he's the godfather. I could understand just being mm -hmm. here in this short time. I could understand why he's here doing that because mm -hmm. it's so much talent here. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's an unbelievable hub of energy. You mm -hmm. know, that's what I feel when I'm around, you know, the studios and folks, just energy. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I would, I would always, you know, have an eye. You know, you can't help but do that, you know, from doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. But really, since it was my first trip, I just really wanted to just meet people mm -hmm. and, and you know, good. I, I can't say that, you know, we're going to, again, take anybody to the promised land, mm -hmm. but I just, I do feel like there's a lot of mm -hmm. opportunity for collaboration, mm -hmm. and I'm definitely very mm -hmm. interested in that. What do you think are some strategies for up and coming uh, artists uh, to kind of be better than the rest, be better than the competition? Um, be, be an individual. Mm -hmm. You know, being an individual. One thing I do see here is that there's a lot of, you know, similarities between, you know, the bands and the singers and the rappers, mm -hmm. you know, probably because it's, it's a phase of that happening because mm -hmm. that happened in hip hop as well. But if you look at the ones that are the biggest, the artists that were the biggest, the, the, art, the biggest artists always set trends. Mm -hmm. And setting a trend is a lonely road. It's not an easy, easy place to go because mm -hmm. you're going to go, you're going to step out at a time and you're gonna find yourself by yourself. Mm -hmm. But it's in that being alone that is where you have to find your security. If you can mm -hmm. do that and you can stand on that, then mm -hmm. eventually what happens is people look at you. They say, oh, wait a minute, what's up with that person? Mm -hmm. As opposed to if you're the one that's like the other one, mm -hmm. then okay, you might get in, mm -hmm. but will you last? You know, will you be mm -hmm. special? Mm -hmm. Will you have anything really to offer? Mm -hmm. You know, if you haven't cried, what can you tell somebody about? If you haven't <laughs> suffered, how can you speak to somebody about mm -hmm. loss, you know? Or if you haven't been happy, how can you mm -hmm. speak about that? So certain mm -hmm. things that come out in songs are really about experience. Mm -hmm. And I think experience is a journey. So mm -hmm. if you don't take the journey, you know? Mm -hmm. Someone told me, um, they, said, they said, Commissioner Gordon, if you wanna fly, you gotta jump off a cliff. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> it's like, that's a, that's a heavy statement. What about getting on a plane? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they didn't go to the plane. It was like, no parachute. Yeah, no, it was like you got to jump off a cliff before you can fly. You know, in, in terms of like the analogy to a bird, you right, know, you right. got to get out the nest. So I think that's what that's what it's all about. Mm. Yeah. What do you think Korean artists need, um, either in their attitudes and their production and their songs or whatever else you can think of that would help them to become more successful in the West? Just time. It's, just, it's inevitable, it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just time. It's nothing that they need, it, it's happening. It's mm -hmm. like, it's, you're in the middle, you know, I guess maybe for me, I have a different perspective from seeing the birth of something like hip hop mm -hmm. and remembering when everybody would say to us in the neighborhood that this is never gonna be commercial music, this is a passing fad, mm -hmm. no one's ever gonna listen to a guy talking over a record, and look at what happened, you mm -hmm. know? So just like they said no one would listen to, you know, Carlos, no one would listen to, to they vote, they, I've heard that my whole career. No mm -hmm. one's gonna listen to a, a rap record about God or something that's positive. Mm -hmm. 
that's happened. So I think it's just a matter of time. Huh. This, is a, this is a beautiful culture, beautiful country, but a beautiful culture with solid talent. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the community here should overlook that or look at the, take the pressure of mm -hmm. what comes from the West and forget the, mm -hmm. the, what it has because mm -hmm. it's very strong. Mm -hmm. When we talk about K-pop, we can't leave out the world sensation Gangnam style song and yes. Psy. And I'm curious what you think about that phenomenon. Um, you know, I think differently now about it after coming here mm -hmm. than maybe how I may have looked at it being abroad. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 we the, the wealth of talent here is so, um, is so broad that I can understand now where um, Gangnam Style came from mm -hmm. in the sense that it was, I thought it was produced well, mm -hmm. I thought it was extremely funny, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought it was very catchy. So. You have been introduced to uh, Korean music and Korean K-pop in particular, K-rock, uh, just very recently. Yes. It's not something that you've kind of listened to for years and years, right? Yeah. So what's your impression, because this is pretty new to you, yes? Yeah, I mean, it, it's like it's new and it's old. At this. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know how, I guess, it's familiar because there's a lot of similarities in what's, you know, what goes on at home. You know, mm -hmm. I grew up with hip-hop. You know, hip-hop started in my neighborhood mm -hmm. in the Bronx. So seeing seeing young people do that you know and all the different various forms of it it still all takes me back to the beginning so there's a very strong connection i mm -hmm. think between what happened at home you know mm -hmm. and it's happening and what's and what's happening here mm -hmm. it's all here Gordon Williams visited an entertainment agency located in Gangnam to discover the next Korean wave star. Here, he was able to meet the members of several K-pop idol groups. He came early to gain more information on the idol groups he was about to meet and to listen to K-pop music, which is still quite new to him. So we record The rookie idol groups finally arrived to meet the Kamosh. <laughs> ah, <laughs> please <laughs> meet you, brother. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Ah, you get here. We tell you, Chunil. Chunil. Oh, please to meet you, <laughs> Gordon. Gordon. Group? All one group? Yes. yes. One group. One group. Um, solo. solo. No, I know your band. <laughs> Good. Well, hopefully we get to, you know, see, yeah. play some music. I brought some music too. We can listen. Good to meet you. Um. First time, Korea. Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, One, two. This meeting pushed the star record producer one we'll step closer to close. finding the next <laughs> big Korean wave hey. star. So, Commissioner Gordon, how did you get your start in music? Mm, DJing. Mm. Started as a DJ. Um, you know, grew up at a time when there weren't any rap records around. Rap was something that we knew in the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. you heard it outside, you know, in a park. You heard it, you know, echoing out of somebody's window. You know, um, that was pretty much what all we knew. Um, mm -hmm. Matter of fact, we didn't even really know that no one else knew about it because it was such common. It was such mm -hmm. a commonplace thing for us mm -hmm. that we thought everybody knew about rap. It wasn't until I actually got old enough to leave the neighborhood to mm -hmm. realize that no, you know, it was only in our neighborhood. So. Mm -hmm. Um, DJing, the first time I saw somebody scratch on a turntable, mm -hmm. um, it was like a bug just bit me, you know. So, of course, now I go upstairs and start scratching up all my mother's records. <laughs> so that <laughs> lasted for about maybe an afternoon where it was like, okay, listen, you got to go in the other room and <laughs> let me find something for you to scratch. So mm -hmm. that started off with a, that started off with one turntable. Started me off, she started me off with one turntable and a mm -hmm. mixer. And then eventually the following year, this is when I was uh, 11 years old, 10, mm -hmm. 10, my 11th birthday. Wow. The turntable and the mixer. And then that following year when I was 12, I had two. And then that's where it started. Incredible. So your mom saw some talent in you then, or did she just not want you to ruin her records? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both. Yeah. You know, I think she, to her credit, I have to, I have to give all credit to her because, um, if she didn't support it, you know, I'm sure some of the things I was saying sounded really crazy, especially because I started so young. You know, mm -hmm. I started asking for these things at a young age, but I always really believed that I could do it. You know, mm -hmm. I just, it, I, I don't know, I just from, I, I never was intimidated by electronics or equipment. Mm -hmm. I, I always just felt like I was supposed to use it. So mm -hmm. 
in supporting that, she definitely built the foundation because once that happened and then all the kids started hanging in my room, <laughs> which was the next phase of, you know, okay, Ma, is it all right if, you know, Terrence comes? Okay, now it's Terrence and Craig. Well, you know what, today is Terrence, Craig, and Junior. <laughs> okay, Ma, it's going to be like six of us, but we're going to be in the back, you know. <laughs> so, so it just kept growing and growing mm -hmm. to, you know, um, this crew that was in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, that little bedroom is where our first record deal actually happened. And tell us about that first record deal. Well, um, I was I had a I was had a friend of mine mm -hmm. who you, again who used to rap, who we first started doing tracks together when I was probably around fifteen ish mm -hmm. or so, and we were just learning about drum machines and mm -hmm. how to figure that thing out. And we had a track that um, that we did. We were trying to, you know, we wanted to be producers, you know, because mm -hmm. now. When we reached around 15, 16, it's when, like I think Sugar Hill Gang, when that record came ah, out, yeah. you know, between the Sugar Hill Gang and then there were a couple of local rap records, mm -hmm. but now it started turning into a thing where, oh, let's try to make a record, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was like, well, you gotta have a song. So, you know, we start trying to put these songs together and we had one song on a little demo, and this was a cassette at the time, because cassettes <laughs> were out. So um, this cassette, we had this one song mm -hmm. on this cassette that, got heard by a, uh, a DJ mm -hmm. who at the time had just started with uh, Atlantic Records. Oh. And he heard it and couldn't do anything with us at Atlantic, but said, you know, he had a friend who had an independent label mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, another area in New York. So we go see this guy, we play him our, our uh, cassette, mm -hmm. and we're thinking we're going there, at least I'm thinking that we're going there to sell him the song because the guy has a, a little label, mm -hmm. and he says, no, you know, I like your version of the song, hmm. I want to sign you two guys, but find two other guys, put a group together. <laughs> so I'm a little taken aback, I'm like 16, mm -hmm. 17, 16, between 16, 17 at the time, I think it was 17, and uh, you know, I'm like, we're gonna be a group. And that's not what I signed up for. Mm -hmm. I thought we were trying to be producers. And my friend who used to rap, he was definitely more of a front man. I've yeah. always been better in the back, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess that start, started from just being a DJ. Mm -hmm. So from the DJ to the engineer to the producer, you know, you're the person yep. behind the artist. So I was always uncomfortable with stage, mm. and he wasn't. So he was like, look, we're gonna be a group, and we're gonna hold some <laughs> auditions, and this is it, we have our yeah. chance. And I'm like, okay, so. We end up literally having an audition. In our first audition, we find two guys, mm -hmm. we do this group, we go in the studio, we record the record. Next thing you know, about a week later, I'm on the radio. Wow. I'm like, we're on the radio. What was it like hearing your music on the crazy. radio? It was crazy. It was ridiculous. You're like, like 16, 17 years yeah, old? Yeah, it was ridiculous. I couldn't even <laughs> believe it. I'm like, how are we on the radio? And not only are we on the radio, people like it, mm -hmm. you know? And everyone now is like, Gordon got a record on the radio. <laughs> so my mother's like, so you have a record on the radio? <laughs> I was like, yeah, Ma, I kind of got a record. <laughs> she must have been so proud of you. Yeah, she was. She yeah. was. I mean, I couldn't pay attention enough to that, uh, as, and I wish I would have, to kind of see her excitement about it because mm -hmm. we were just going, going, going. Mm -hmm. It was like, a, now you have to do shows, so now we have to figure that out. Wow. You know, what's it like to be on stage and go rehearse? So, what about school? <laughs> um, well, I graduated, that high school had finished, uh, I graduated early because I was a year ahead mm -hmm. in, from just when I started. I didn't get skipped, I was just a year ahead. So when I got out of high school, I was still 16. So that yeah. summertime between 16 and 17 mm -hmm. is when the record happened. Motown is where a lot of African Americans get their start, and we've seen some of the most incredible R&B artists um, and incredible talent come out of there. Mm -hmm. And you were also signed with Motown, and uh, you're an incredible talent and a great producer. So what do you think it is about Motown that was able to help a lot of people get their start and also help you get your start? Well, I think the the you know, Motown is an unbelievable story, mm -hmm. you know, and Barry Gordy and the people that he was able to put together were all incredible talents. Mm -hmm. um, the Motown that I got signed to was very different than that Motown, mm -hmm. but I think the, the underlying premise of what Motown was about was mm -hmm. still there because even when we got there, uh, myself and my partner who I actually work with now, his name is Rich Nice, mm -hmm. really great producer himself, has worked with a lot of big artists, 50 Cent, Ludacris, Track Masters. Um, Rich was rapping then, and mm -hmm. I, was, I had a production deal. And um, 
it was a it was a learning environment for mm -hmm. us. Even though we didn't really have really big success with the stuff we were doing, mm -hmm. we were very influential on a lot of people mm -hmm. that were around us because at that time Motown Records um, was owned by was purchased by MCA mm -hmm. and MCA had also purchased Uptown Records. So Uptown is where Heavy D was signed. Mm -hmm. um, Puff Daddy, at that time he was an intern, he wasn't Puff Daddy, then he was Sean, you mm -hmm. know, and he was the intern working there, and you had Mary J. Blige, and you had mm -hmm. Jodeci, and you know, so you had, it was a hub of, of, of um, a hub of creativity. Mm -hmm. Teddy Riley was signed there, it was a group named Guy that he had, mm -hmm. it was their beginnings. So all of us were kind of coming up at the same time and, and interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. So we all sort of learned. Some were a lot more successful than others, mm -hmm. but the thing about the Motown environment was that there was a lot of communication mm -hmm. and there were elders around that had been in the business for a mm -hmm. while that could always sit you down and go, well, you know, don't do that, you know, you should, you know, close the door, let me talk to you about this. And, and you know, it was always that. So mm -hmm. I think that's what was, you know, it, it was a learning environment, teaching environment. You've also worked at Sony Music and uh, you've spoken a little bit about your time there and the artists with whom you've worked. Um, I'm very curious though because working with uh, an artist and just working on their album is probably different than working on a soundtrack of a movie. What were some of the differences uh, that you noticed? Mm, yeah, it was different. You know, the whole experience of going to be employed by a label, I always tell folks that that's when I really learned about the music business. Mm -hmm. Even though I had been in the business prior to being at Sony for at least, you know, at least 12 years, mm -hmm. it was like starting all over once you got mm -hmm. there because then you really understand the dynamics of what went on behind, you know, marketing and promoting mm -hmm. and actually making money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing to create something, but it's a whole other thing to s actually sell it mm -hmm. and see a return mm -hmm. on that and or see a loss on it and how you deal with that. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's really what we learned there. Now, something like a soundtrack, especially that particular one, mm -hmm. because it was such a big movie, um, there was a lot of pressure in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, delivery because the music was a, is a smaller piece of this overall movie. Yes. So you get to see the demands of who, you, you actually get to see who's the, the, the biggest, uh, the head honcho in the room, you know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You may have thought you were the big one until you meet the director, and then you may have thought he was the big one until you meet the executive producer, <laughs> and you thought he was the big one until you meet the head of the studio. <laughs> so it's kind of, you, you learn like mm -hmm. the hierarchy of, mm -hmm. of what, in terms of um, profit, because the movie makes much more, the movies make much more money than the music, mm -hmm. you know, division. So that particular movie, because it was very expensive to create and then made so much money afterwards, yes. it was, um, a lot different than making a record. And with that type of a uh, soundtrack uh, album, uh, how much time did you realistically have to, to make all the music? Well, that's a collaborative effort. I really worked on maybe three songs on that soundtrack. Mm -hmm. It just so happened that I did the biggest song. So it, mm -hmm. it, it overshadows everything else, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of other people that contributed. They gave the best to you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, no, they gave the problems to me because that was really what it was about, was fix really? a problem. Yeah, that's really how oh. it ended up really happening that I got involved in it. There were some issues that were happening in terms of completing it, mm -hmm. and it wasn't really my project. It became my project by default. I mean, I'm thankful mm -hmm. that it became my project, but it became the project because there were issues. Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, commit, you know, that's kind of the title commissioner, part of the, the, it's like the blessing and the curse. It's <laughs> like the commissioner will fix it, so it doesn't matter how bad it is or mm -hmm. what time it is or, you know, how much sleep you don't mm -hmm. get, go fix it, you know. So this was one of those go fix it because mm -hmm. the, the, the music was, at that point, was hampering the completion of the movie. Mm -hmm. So it really needed to get done, so they sort of said, get in there and figure it out. You've won several Grammy Awards, and for most singers, songwriters, composers, producers, you know, it's, it's such an incredible honor, and you've won several. Mm -hmm. uh, as a Grammy Award winner, um, what do you think about you know, having won those awards? Does that, does that validate what you do, or do you already feel successful with what you've done, even if you didn't win those awards? I think the first one was kind of that you know was a validating feeling mm -hmm. really because not because of the award itself it's you know you have a lot of naysayers along the way so it is mm -hmm. kind of it is kind of rewarding to mm -hmm. 
to think back, to, you know, to reflect on all the people that said, oh, you wouldn't make it, or this wouldn't work, or this will never happen, and then to actually stand there holding it and, and be recognized by your peers, it's a big deal. But mm -hmm. you know, after that, it just kind of is fleeting because you know, the music business is all about what have you done lately, so mm -hmm. you kind of, you almost can't rest on that. You have to keep, mm -hmm. you know, you have to keep moving. But mm -hmm. it is good. It is great to be able to reflect on it, though. Now, especially mm -hmm. now, looking back and like you said, you know, I've won several, and you know, it's an accomplishment. So yeah. I think it's a, you know, it does help. I mean, that's Good. that's such an exciting thing. I mean, when you first found out that you won the Grammys, wh what did you do? Well. Um, you don't find out until you're there, you know, so, you know, you're nominated, but they kind of keep it, it's like mm -hmm. this whole hush-hush thing where mm -hmm. they try to keep it so they can get, I guess that's, you know, you know, your TV people, you want to <laughs> get somebody excited on camera, so mm -hmm. they kind of try to keep that thing, but we sort of knew, like, when we got there towards the middle <clears throat> of the day that mm -hmm. at least one of them she had won. the first one was with Lauren mm -hmm. that at least one of them she had won. She ended up winning, she got nominated ten times and ended up winning I think five or six wow. that night, mm -hmm. and I won two, <clears throat> two of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, by the middle of the day, you know, we realized, okay, you know what, you got one. But see, I was also working, mm -hmm. so because I'm mixing the show. So even at the Grammys, that here I am receiving the award, I'm running between the the venue and the <gasps> truck to go mix wow. in the truck because I'm watching it on television. So mm -hmm. again, I didn't really have a time to, de the first one, mm -hmm. I didn't get a chance to accept it because I was actually in the truck. <laughs> so someone else <laughs> stood there who everyone thought later on that was me because mm -hmm. no one had ever seen me. They just heard Commissioner Gordon, you know, the Grammy Award winner and this other guy is standing there. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that's Commissioner Gordon. So <laughs> it's not till the last one, which was album of the year. Mm -hmm. And that award happened um, right after Lauren finished performing. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm in the truck because I have to mix the performance. And mm -hmm. as soon as I finish, all of the guys are in the truck and they're saying, you know, they're reading the nomination and they hear my name. So I'm real still focusing on like turning down faders and stuff. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, yo, what are you doing? They just called your name. I said, really? He's like, get out there, get out there. So now they all like push me out the truck. So now I'm I start running, there. right? Because I'm running to the stage and I'm running backstage. So mm -hmm. now all the security gets me and they bring me behind the stage. And literally as I get to backstage, it's like Lauren Hill. So I hear all the people clapping and she's standing out and I'm backstage kind of like, what do I do? And mm -hmm. then somebody comes behind me, like one of the security guys, yes. and just pushes me <laughs> out. So I kind of like stumble Whoa. out. Yeah, yeah. kind of like stumble out. Mm -hmm. And um, I turned to my left and Sting is standing there because Sting and Whitney Houston mm -hmm. gave her that award. Mm -hmm. So I turned in, I'm like, whoa, that's Sting. So I'm caught up in the fact that, hey man, it's Sting, you know? <laughs> and all these people are clapping. Mm -hmm. And so it was a really surreal moment because I didn't even get a chance again to set myself properly. So the same mm -hmm. guy who was standing there during the first one yes. was standing in my spot that was <laughs> I was supposed to receive the award. So when the camera shot happened, I wasn't in the camera shot again. Yeah. Who is this person? <laughs> so of course, my mother and everybody home is calling me like, where were you? Where? I was like, oh, I don't know. I was standing there. But you know, they had everything sort of, you know, how they mm -hmm. block where you, where you stand. Yes. And I didn't know anything about television and all of that at that time mm -hmm. as far as being the person in front because I was always the person in back so mm -hmm. I thought because I was standing there I was on it but it was a tight shot of just her and uh, it was supposed to be me the person mm -hmm. standing next to her and I was like one person over so <laughs> that was a little like hey but maybe I even thought afterwards maybe that mm -hmm. was a good thing because mm -hmm. I still kept a bit of my anonymity you know mm -hmm. I could still walk in the neighborhood and not get mobbed yes yes yeah. You've been uh, a DJ when you started, and then you signed with the record label. Then you produced, and you worked in you know big shops, you know, you know big corporations. And now you have your own boutique shop. Mm -hmm. What do you think kind of motivated you to start your own kind of boutique as opposed to kind of being with the big boys? Mm, Self determination, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to wanting it, it, the freedom to just create again, but mm -hmm. also wanting to be able to make maybe connections that, you know, corporations get, you, some, of, some things get bogged down in that, you know, mm -hmm. and the decision making process sometimes because, you know, you may have, you know, 50 heads in a room, it's just difficult to get things done. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, all right, you mm -hmm. know, we've been doing this long enough and, mm -hmm. you know, we've been fortunate to have won awards and met really great people and, and you know, and be um, validated, as we were talking about earlier, be yes. validated by all of that. So you don't have to prove mm -hmm. anything anymore. Mm -hmm. You just want to 
Now, mm -hmm. do your real work. Yes. You know, do the work that's rewarding. Do mm -hmm. the work that helps. Do the work that you know creates special moments. Mm -hmm. And but find ways. We got to make money, so we got to find <laughs> ways to make it. You know. Sure. Yeah, we have to do that, mm -hmm. but not let that stand in front of mm -hmm. the, the the creative process mm -hmm. and the um, the specialness of those moments. Mm -hmm. And now you're doing this this incredible business, yes? Yeah, we started, you know, this is, I, I call it a, a global cultural exchange. That's mm -hmm. what we're kind of loosely titling it. It's called, the name of the company is Lalabella. Mm -hmm. Film projects, there's music mm -hmm. projects, there's, um, there's television projects, mm -hmm. there's technology projects, there's, you know, there's merchandise. Do Actually, this is, this is one of our... You know, one of our the lines. Oh, yeah, I like one, of, it. one of our lines. Yeah, huh. color heritage is one of our lines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we just connecting our dots because it's really about creativity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, wherever there's art, that's what we're looking at. And then you also have to cross pollinate. So, mm -hmm. in terms of finding, you know, if you work on a movie, a movie needs music. So, if mm -hmm. we're working on the mu movie, why not be working on the music and trying to find mm -hmm. ways to create opportunities for the the you know for both mm -hmm. both things. The word Lala Bella has such a cool kind of rhythm, and you've chosen it as the name of your company. How did you come up with that? Uh, the name was actually a takeoff on Lali Bella, which mm -hmm. is a church in Ethiopia. It's an it's oh. actually a historical location, but it's a city and a mm -hmm. church. And uh, I became aware of Ethiopian culture primarily through the Marley family. Oh. And, but uh, a good friend of mine was the ex-patriarch from the church. He was the mm -hmm. archbishop. His name mm -hmm. was Abuna Yisak. And he spoke to me a lot about uh, different qualities of, mm -hmm. of leadership mm -hmm. and uh, counseling, and as well as spiritual things of a spiritual nature, but mm -hmm. more dealing with uh, business because he was very well educated in business. So when he told me, you know, when I heard the name Lali Bella, I always thought, oh, that's an interesting name. And he told mm -hmm. me the story of Lala Bella, which is Lali Bella, which is a very interesting and longer story, which I wouldn't go into here, but it's very significant. Mm -hmm. That was the, the story behind the name. And it's, cool. and it's also helps to remind me of him and, mm -hmm. the, and the qualities that mm -hmm. he had and some of the things that he, you know, talked to me about in terms of, you know, um, helping people. Mm -hmm. Helping people seems to be a very important part of your life. Yes. Uh, with with your professional work and maybe even your personal time and uh, your volunteer time, uh, why do you think you have such a strong uh, desire to help people? Because I was helped, you know, and I was helped by significant people who, at a time when, you know, it's like I fell down and couldn't get up, and somebody helped me stand up. So mm -hmm. I try to remember that that those times when I couldn't get up, there was somebody that helped, and yeah, I was able to stand after a while and and do a lot of things. But mm -hmm. at those moments, if those people weren't there, I don't know if I would have uh, been able to get up. So mm -hmm. I try to remember that. You know, you talk about helping uh, disadvantaged kids mm -hmm. uh, with uh, what you want to do, and I'm curious where that desire to help comes from. Do you think it might have something to do with your upbringing? Absolutely, it's from my mom. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you know I've had um, I've had really strong support. You know, mm -hmm. and I was in a single parent home. I grew up in a neighborhood where it was kind of rough. You know, mm -hmm. and not the roughest, but rough enough. Mm -hmm. You know, and saw a lot of things. And without that support, I wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So when I start to meet you know, other young people, and particularly those that are affected by hip hop, which mm -hmm. is pretty much the entire world now, you know, it used <laughs> yes. to be our neighborhood. And hip hop is a global phenomenon, mm -hmm. you know, now, and I can remember its beginnings and mm -hmm. I can remember what made us do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about gangsters. It wasn't about balling. It wasn't about blinging. It wasn't about anything mm -hmm. like that. It was about balling, changing what it. Is that? Balling, balling is like, a, <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. I'm in Korea. <laughs> well, how would you say, okay, uh, flash. Okay, you know, so like bling. I know bling. Bling, bling. <laughs> yeah, ball. Okay. Well, bling is the result of balling. Okay. <laughs> if you're balling, then you get bling. Got you know it. what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty much that. So, um, you know, it wasn't about that. It was mm. about, there's always going to be an element of, of, you know, machismo, grandiose. Mm. And a, that's just human nature. There's mm -hmm. a, and that's just a male thing. But at the, at the end of the day, what hip hop came from was, uh, disadvantage you mm -hmm. who didn't have and who had to try to create something mm -hmm. we use the example of saying we our formula was we had to take zero and zero and we had to make one 
We didn't even mm -hmm. have one to, mm -hmm. plus one. You know, it was how do you take nothing and get something? And mm -hmm. that's hip hop. Mm -hmm. You can't play an instrument, you find a way. That's a, you scratch a turntable. You can't sing, you talk. You know, you mm -hmm. don't have a club to dance in, you dance on the street. Concrete's too hard, they'll put a piece of cardboard down. And now you start breaking. You know, mm -hmm. so all of these things that now have become a cultural phenomenon, yes. and, or, or I should say, not even a cultural, a commercial phenomenon, were cultural things mm -hmm. based on expression of cult, expression mm -hmm. of, of um, desire of wanting to do better, mm -hmm. and desire of wanting to have fun, and the desire of people wanting to come together. Mm -hmm. And that also gets lost in the commercialness of it. Yes. So in wanting to give back, and so in teaching, it's more about trying to bring that concept mm -hmm. back to it so that now we can come together because mm -hmm. you know we only got one planet to live on. Absolutely. And you've been involved with some work in Africa. Uh, would you like to tell us about that too? Yeah, well, um, you know, I'm 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 involved. In, like I said, I don't sleep. I'm also involved. <laughs> I also teach. You know, so I have an acad we have an academy, ah. Lala Bella Academy, mm -hmm. which was inspired by my time that I spent in Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, actually in Soweto, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I got to meet some folks there again because of music, but and seeing you know the conditions in some mm -hmm. of the places that I visited mm -hmm. you know I wanted to work with the young people there and try to find ways it really inspired me mm -hmm. to see their their commitment to um, just their commitment to hope even mm -hmm. even in circumstances that were really dire mm -hmm. you know so I just felt like you know there's got to be something we could do or you know I didn't really know what it was mm -hmm. but I knew that music affects everyone mm -hmm. and affected them in particular because that's what brought me mm -hmm. there so that's where the Academy sort of came out of and and it was really about using music to try to inspire you know help deal with social issues mm -hmm. and those kinds of things but now that has that has spread but Africa was the place where it really started Inspired by his time in Africa, Gordon Williams is building a supply and human resource network to foster gifted individuals in music. He's established a music academy in the U.S. to provide them with an opportunity to learn and grow as musicians. Aside from developing his career as a music producer, he is pursuing a new dream. His dedication will make this world a brighter place by giving the less fortunate a chance to shine. I really feel very strongly about uh, you reap what you sow. Yes. And uh, it seems like you've sown a lot of really good karma. You've you've helped a lot of people along the way, and and now with your Lalabell Academy and what you really want to do to help you know bring about really good quality music, good quality talent, you know, back into the scene and and not uh, not compromise on some of those values. Um, so I really look forward to you know seeing what's going to be happening in the future for you. Yes, well, thank you. What are some of the things that you are planning in the future? Um, we def we have uh, we have uh, three or four artists that are you know we're nurturing right now mm -hmm. at home. You know we have a band, the White Tiger Society. We have mm -hmm. a we have a, we actually have two Asian rappers, which is huh. kind of s strange. You know like how all this happened because they were totally yeah. they didn't have anything to do with me coming here. Mm -hmm. This happened out of you know like I was telling you about my friend that brought me here. Yes. Um, we have a fem we have a Chinese young lady named Cache, mm -hmm. and then we have a Hawaiian mm -hmm. rapper named Casey, and we're working on their projects now mm -hmm. at home. And uh, we also have another rapper uh, named Rome DeMarco, who actually has a record now that's on the radio in, mm. uh, in New York. So, Very cool. you know, yeah, we have some, you know, as well as Steve, we're always going to be with Steve. It's always going to be mm -hmm. a Marley project. Steve's working on, a, on, a, on his album, on a new album right now, yeah. and I'm looking forward to bringing him here, you know, doing some exchange between the people and the folks that I've met over mm -hmm. here, because I can see there's a lot of um, similarities and openings. Yes. So I, I haven't figured out the business of it yet, mm -hmm. but I know that that's going to happen. What do you think is one of the most important qualities that a producer, a good producer, needs to have? Mm, I think the ability to listen. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be able to guide a situation, mm -hmm. an artist or a session, you know, mm -hmm. or musicians, but you have to be able to kind of, you know listen to allow things to happen that's something that i learned from mm -hmm. quincy you know mm -hmm. early at the, at the at the beginning because you know the impression that i had of who he would be you know that i built up in my mind was so different than who he was when i saw him you know got the opportunity to see him just interact with 
-hmm. folks in the studio. Mm -hmm. He was extremely humble. He was extremely, he, he listened to everybody and he, and he tried mm -hmm. to incorporate that into what he was doing. And it was very zen, you know, like looking at that as mm -hmm. opposed to, okay, well, I need you to do this and I need you to do that and I need you, which is what I kind of thought I would have seen, mm -hmm. but it was actually the exact opposite. Interesting. Well, I think that what you're aiming to do is really remarkable. And I mean, you really have been a mentor to a lot of the artists with you, you've worked and with whom you've worked. And you uh, are, by nature, you know, someone who has a lot to be able to share with people. What do you think is one of your strengths that you can kind of pass on and share with the, the youth? Mm, just that don't, don't give up. Like it's never over until it's over, you know. It's it's just keep keep on. The race isn't for the swift; it's for those that make it to the end. Mm. And that's really the bottom line. It's like just keep on, and you'll get there. Last but not least, um, I ask a kind of philosophical question to each of my guests. Uh oh. And uh, given that you are in the business of music mm -hmm. and that you love music, I want to ask you, what does producing mean to you and what does music mean to you? What does it mean to me? I think uh, producing really is about, for me, it's about bringing people together, mm -hmm. you know, br nurturing, bringing, bringing something forth, you know, mm -hmm. from, from nothing, you know, create, creating. Music to me is, music represents the, the healing mm -hmm. uh, qualities of sound, you know, but now it, it depends on how you use it because the same thing that puts something together can tear it apart, that same energy. So mm -hmm. I think music is a, a very, very powerful force for change. Music is a very, very powerful force for communication. Mm -hmm. But music is also a very, very powerful force for disharmony, as much as there's harmony. It's mm -hmm. also a force that can be used to um, point you in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So um, it represents to me the healing of a nation, the healing mm -hmm. of the nation. So mm -hmm. that's really what my interest is in music and it's sort of always been mm -hmm. I just didn't understand it then you know mm -hmm. because of the artists and the people that were influenced that influenced me like a Curtis Mayfield or Bob Marley mm -hmm. or James Brown or you know or Michael Jackson or the people that are who who we've looked to as the elders who have who have guided us mm -hmm. that's what their music was about so that's the only thing that I really understand and know and that's what I want to stay on <laughs> awesome well Gordon, it's been so amazing to be able to talk to you and get first-hand info from an industry giant <laughs> that has, that has, has come to Korea because, you know, Korea is, as you said, you know, really excited about its talent and wants to be able to send Korean talent to the rest of the world. And we need people like you who can come with the breadth of knowledge and experience that you've had to be able to see what we have here. And of course, no one can guarantee that there's going to be, you know, X, Y, Z stars, you know, at a certain point. However, um, the fact that you are in interested in Korean talent I think says a lot about what we have to offer and uh, I'm really curious to see what happens in the future so um, yes. I'm super excited <laughs> thank you I'm excited to be here as well awesome thank you again for being on my show and I look forward to hearing all the great things in the future oh thank you Susan <laughs> thank you Korea <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much